Clark. My name's Tony Glenville, and I'm a freelance fashion commentator and journalist and consultant. And I am chairing this discussion. And I'm going to hand over to the rest of the team to introduce themselves, uh, perhaps starting with Sim. Hello, everyone. <laughs> My name's Sim Skavatsa. Uh, I've been in high, high street retail for about 30 years. I started my life as a buyer at uh, a company called Chelsea Girl that was turned into River Island. I'm sure you'll remember and may basically worked for many of the high street retailers um, for a long time. I am currently the chair or the deputy chair of the University of the Arts London. So I have the pleasure of sitting above the six colleges, um, LCF being one of those. I also chair the People's Strategy Committee and I'm really interested in sustainable fashion. Hello everyone, my name is Mary Wallace. I'm a retail and consumer behaviour specialist at IBM. What that really means is I look at what people in the real world are doing or not doing or might do and how brands and businesses, especially businesses in fashion, should respond to that. Thank you. Francis? Hi everyone, my name is Francis O'Dell and I work at LCF, part of the Graduate Futures team. Um, we're a team that sit outside the curriculum and we work with students and alumni, realise their career ambitions, be that employment, freelancing or starting a business. Thank you. Harris? Hi everyone, my name is Harris Elliott, I'm a Creative Director and Curator also visiting lecturer, um, resident at St. Martin's and also the Royal College of Art. I've recently launched an agency called Bold and we've just partnered with the British Fashion Council to start creating a legacy programme for black British design within the UK. Thank you. Jason? Hi everybody, I am um, a product and brand management and strategist. I've spent more than 20 years working across fashion, uh, luxury and sports brands um, in Europe, in America and in Asia. And most importantly, I am um, an alum of the London College of Fashion, which I'm very proud of. Thank you. And last but not least, Harold. Hi, everybody. Um, well, I'm proud to say that I uh, studied the first year that London College of Fashion um, was created in 1965. I studied for two years, uh, was a great benefit to me throughout my career. From then, I've been a manufacturer, uh, retailer, owning some uh, renowned British brands. I was uh, the longest serving chairman of the British Fashion Council, and I am I'm proud to be an alum of the London College of Fashion. Thank you very much indeed. Let's start with the questions and I'm going to pose each question to one of you to start with and then obviously those of you that have got more to add in will will follow through. My first question is for Jason. In spite of the ramifications on the fashion business globally, is it time for a rethink or a reset of the industry anyway? I, it's always good to start with the really small questions there, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what, I, 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 think, I think we're heading into a new phase. And I think that we, we look at fashion as quite a stable thing. But it came to me a few years ago, I was looking at the, the archive of, of, the, of the brand Vianney, Madeleine Vianney's brand. It was only a, you know, 100 years old when people were working directly for clients and people like Balenciaga were forming an industry that was about one-on-one -on -one craftsmanship. And since then, we've sort of radically been through the ready-to-wear revolution and then into the retail powerhouse and the mass sourcing and supply chains, meaning that we can source things all over the world. Now we face ethical and sustainable challenges. We face diversity challenges. And I do feel that fashion is the most important part about fashion is that it holds a mirror up to society. And you have to ask yourself right now, is it holding a mirror up to society as we want it to be, as we want to be represented? And I think maybe not. 
I think it's too much about exclusivity, not enough about inclusivity. It's not about positive, sustainable sourcing methods. So I do think we will start to feel a lot of pressure that will come from the marketplaces, come from the consumers, and this will force a new chapter in the evolution of fashion. And for me, as somebody who, you know, is now an executive within the industry, that really excites me. I think it should be an agile industry that's always on the move and is always reflecting society. And that's what true creativity is all about. And, and I sort of look forward to the next chapter as it comes in. Thank you. Anybody else something to add into that question? Yeah, I, I just want to echo um, the importance of, you know, whether or not it's consumer power or people power, because I think people want to make informed decisions. Um, I sort of um, left college. Um, I went to the College of the Distributed Trades back in the day, um, and I, I sort of uh, worked my way up um, through buying um, and the industry as was. Um, you know, in, in terms of the, the, the change in society, culturally, how we live the last sort of eight, nine months, I think what we have to do is, is basically acclimatise um, across all touch points, um, supply chain, the transparency, um, you know, the ethical, the sustainable, because I think, I think people want that. Um, and if, if they're sort of looking at the brands that they're going to buy from and those brands aren't maybe sharing the same values um, that, that they hold dear, I think those brands will go, go to the wall. If I may add to that, if that's OK, um, just actually building on that point, I think it's a yes, but in answer to your question. So, yes, but we need more than a rethink because... We can't keep shouting at the consumer, which is what's happening now. You know, we want you to care more. We want you to use fewer resources, pollute less, but we still want to sell you things at the same price or maybe a higher price. And we want you to keep buying things and maybe more, because if we don't have those profits, then what is the business that we actually have? So I think um, we're at a point of tension. So on the one hand, we've got more, we, we do have more, let's say consciousness coming through but on the other hand we have new ways it's you know it's like uh, influencers and unboxing videos haul videos get ready with me videos it's like a conveyor belt of narcissist reflections do you know what I mean so that point of tension I think um it's been a very slow run-up over the past 10 years where we sort of spat on a hanky and wiped the face of fashion when bad things have happened which have kind of gone away again. Things like, terrible things like Rana Plaza, you know? And we said reset, we said transparency, but then we carried on. So it's kind of reminded me, forgive this analogy about like the, where we are with the Premier League in football right now, because there's no end to the season. And those clubs are in such complex financial entanglements, you know, they're like hamsters on a wheel. And everyone's tired, but there's more games, there's more events, there's more debts to service, right? And what's just happened or happening is exposing how fragile a lot of that was. And I think a similar thing in fashion has, has kind of happened. So I'm looking to see where this reset is, is coming from. And that's something I'm interested to hear, perhaps as part of this discussion. Can, can, I just, can, I, can I just add something? Yes, of course. You know, I... I, I, I unfortunately have witnessed this before we were a very strong clothing manufacturing country um, we post-war uh, one of the strongest in the world um, burton's montague burton as it was in those days employed ten thousand people manufacturing clothing it went on from there and i can't Give you the numbers but there was so many factories throughout the uk and we were proud of what we actually did and the skills that we employed move and it moved morphed into becoming clothing becoming in the, we became a nation of retailers um and everywhere every corner every street there was a fashion shop boutique through the 60s coming through to 
where we really found, found ourselves in the last year, or probably even the, go back two years, um, as to where things have to change again, because, or even longer, slightly than that, where the same amount of clothing is being worn and bought, but it's being sold online. So we're, the reset, I think, is where we are. And what we're talking about is we had to reset people's mindset of going from an employment and fashion of being a part of a manufacturing opportunity or operation and then going into a retail operation to now understanding the fact is being in fashion means it's got a great future. That's my view, but in a different foreset because it is being bought online. It's reset, but it's not just fashion that's doing this. It's happened to every other industry. Some of that will crop up again, I think, during the other questions that we're going to be looking at. And I'll go on to Sim to ask her my second question. It's very short and very easy in a lot of ways. Right. Classic versus innovative. Your thoughts, please. It, that's, it may be short, but it's very difficult. Um, <laughs> fashion is built on innovation. Innovation is what fashion is, is all about. Um, it, it, it always has been. However, like the rest of the world, there are always two parts. We've got luxury, we've got high street, but I think we've got classic and we've got innovation. Style usually walks through the realm of, of classic. And I just think that the balance of the two at the moment is really important. I think balance is the key word for most of the things that are going on in the world today. You wouldn't chuck out one um, to the detriment of the other. So I'm afraid it's a really tricky question because they're both really important to me anyway. Um, couldn't do without innovation. I think this is a really special time for small brands. I think the agility that Jason mentioned um, is absolutely really important. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, out of this sort of quite depressing situation, creativity actually blossoms. So this is a real test. And, and I think lots of little brands being able to flourish, being able to nimbly maneuver, being able to cover the sustainability that customers now expect, being able to control um, the things that they're developing. So it's, they're both really important. Anyone else want to chime in? Yeah, I, I don't think the, um, they're at polar opposites because um, of old, we might have assumed that innovation meant one thing and classic meant something else. But even if you took something like the Margiela Tabby boot, even though it didn't originate with Margiela, it refers back to a Japanese history, we would still deem it as innovative when it, when it was launched. And those boots are still concurrent now. So there's that, that idea that innovation can also produce design classics. And so therefore, classicism can come out of innovation. Completely. Thank you. Completely agree. Yeah. Yeah, cool. and I, I just, I just wanted to. Sorry, Harold. I just wanted no, to please, please. Um, add. They do coexist, and I think the interesting thing is when we look at innovation. I think generally we think it's got to be new. It's got to be something that's never been done before. And if I look at how our students are innovating they're not actually throwing baby out with the bathwater. They're, they're, they're looking um, and they're, they're looking at it from an opportunity perspective, but they're also looking at it um, from um, a, a sort of um, solving a problem perspective. So I think with innovation, maybe in, in what this new world order is gonna be, there will, will still be innovation, but it, it's not sort of new for new sake. It's got to be something that's gonna be credible and have longevity and, and actually be innovative and, and sort of make a positive change as well. Anyone else? No, I, I was just going to say, I wanted to endorse what uh, Skim said, and that is the, the ability to be nimble, um, creative, small, and it takes me back, which I keep saying to the boutique, that 
was having things made, made locally to be different to the boutique that was just a few streets away. And this is what we've got again. The difference is that boutique could be online instead of having to have a retail store. Nevertheless, the opportunity it creates for people not only to enjoy what they're wearing that is different, that is giving the uh, the the creator or, or, or of that SME the opportunity to build a business uh, and become a brand in their own right. I think it's 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 a, what has happened here is is, is brought forward what was going to happen uh, anyway. Thank you, Harold. My next question is going to be for you, but before I ask you your question, I believe I have to make an announcement and offer some congratulations for a new role, which is that you are Business and Enterprise Advisor for the London College of Fashion at UAL. So hearty congratulations, but most of thank all, you. thank you for bringing your experience and expertise into this new role. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to take this on. So my question comes back to something that's cropped up earlier as well. Um, gender and race are two global points of major concern and both have a huge role within the fashion current um, area. Is our response and the concerns strong enough about gender and race and all the associated things within the fashion world? It's a, it's a very good question, if I might say to you, that I think that we in the fashion world have always had a very broad reach. Um, fashion actually is, is leads people's mindset towards what they enjoy, what they want to wear, what they want to create and how they wear it. Um, and I would suggest that um, we, we have the world's window whether it's through music, um, music stars, people's idols. Um, and it is something that people actually, actually understand that that item of fashion, no matter who it's being worn by, is something, oh, I would really want, or what I really like, or how was it really made? Who really created it? And this is where we have, I believe, fashion is a very, 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 part of what the question you've asked me and it's going to continue to be a very important part throughout the world it straddles every stratosphere of what that point you've made so I, I think that it will never weaken it's going to get stronger and I think it's going to be an important part of everybody's life that it matters not other than one thing that if people enjoy fashion they will enjoy it, no matter what gender or what race they are. Thank you. I'm sure we we'll have some other thoughts. Anyone who's next? I'll just say something. I think we've got away with a lot in fashion um, up until now. And I just think that whilst there is so much seismic change going on, now is the time to rethink about some of the barriers that exist um, to pay, especially, you know, people of colour um, coming into design. It's a very white environment. It is. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that we consider what we might do to help people that want to enter the environment when perhaps money is an issue or, you know, a lack of internships and those sorts of things. So I don't think we should kid ourselves. I think we have got some issues like all other areas of society um, and we just need to be open, investigate them uh, and try and rebalance, is my word again, the, the sort of access um, from, a, from a, a race point of view. And from a gender point of view, um, I've enjoyed my career working most of the time with women, to be honest. So, you know, a, a, an industry that employs a major amounts of women, both in store um, and at head office. But the barrier has always been for women higher up the ranks. So when it comes to um, white men running big fashion businesses, that's usually the case and it still is the case today. Um, it is changing, 
but there is more work to be done. So it's, again, it's that kind of, there are, there are pockets of blockage. And I just think we need to recognize that and we need to work towards changing that. Um, various reasons for that, but you know, at the end of the day, people need role models. You know, we've got to be able to look at the people above and, and as you're entering the industry say, yes, that could be me. Absolutely one day that could be me. So we still have work to do, I think, to create some of those role models. Anyone else? I also think, um, Tony, to these points, it's sort of, it's a really amazing moment and a very interesting cultural moment in terms of the branded world right now. It feels like some of the most important issues in the world have been promoted on the platforms of brands. And it's important that we really protect that. Over the last, say, 20 years, independent fashion has almost been turned into conglomerates and major groups now exist within the industry. And, and within that, you, you become an employee of a major organization rather than a rebel with a cause, which is where a lot of creativity starts. And it's really important that, you know, when it came to spreading the Black Lives Matter word, it was actually spread a lot on superstar athletes, a lot on brands who would give them a platform to spread it. When it became about pressure on democracy in the US lately, it was big brands promoting the notion of going out to Though when we look at sustainability, it's brands like Patagonia that are waving the flag for supply chain transparency. And one thing that does concern me is as these groups get bigger and bigger, does the voice of saying the right thing that needs to be said for the good of humanity and the good of culture become suppressed, not because of any sort of evil, just because you become an, an employee of a mega, mega organization rather mm -hmm. than a platform of your own right to say what's important to be said. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, may I add to what Sim said, please? Because that really struck a chord with me, if that's okay. Um, so I think it's getting better, but I still see what I call the power structure of the PWG or the posh white girl across, across the majority of what I kind of encounter in, in fashion world. I, I mean ma mainstream fashion here, so in editorial, marketing, you know, who's telling the stories or, or who's appearing to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting to see kind of the panic of brands um, when Black Lives Matter was, 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 was very prevalent a few months ago and, and just how wrong a lot of brands actually got it and continue to get wrong. Because I'm still seeing loads of articles and things about some of those common fashion favorites like uh, French girl chic, which actually just makes me want to throat punch whoever actually invented that. Uh, if you just look at the people featured in anything under French girl chic, they are without exception, thin, white, a certain class, certain income, without exception. And I think fashion support, mainstream fashion support at the moment for gender and race it actually comes from the position of, of calling it out, or in other words, you know, look everyone, we're doing something. And the day when the, when the day comes that we don't have to call it out and it just is, is one that I really look forward to. And I'm only touching there on, on visible rep representation in marketing. What I actually really want to know is um, what's happening at board level, at C-suite level, directors of heads of level so you know stop showing me your marketing and actually show me where the power and the decision making and the money is today and what you're doing to change that for the better that's what i'm i'm interested to to find out i think Thank you. sorry it's really important i think you know for young people now looking at businesses looking where they want to go and work they need to look who is represented on the board who the leader of that business is and therefore the culture that emanates um, from, from that leader and that leadership team. And they've got to look at the business and say, you know, is there somewhere where I'm going to feel comfortable and I'm going to be able to get on? Because it's all very well brands promoting BLM through logos and things like that. But if there's not a black person on the board of Nike, it, you know, you've got to walk the talk as well. So we're in this situation where challenge needs to continue to happen, I think. Thank you. Anybody else? Right. No.
Sorry, just to yeah. back on, um, Tony, I think it also needs to start at, at an educational level because when students are applying to said fashion courses up and down the country, um, if they're not represented from a gender or a race perspective, doesn't necessarily need to be specifically on those courses, but within those institutions and within those environments, those, those barriers get put there straight away if people don't feel like there's somebody that they could relate to at that space. So before we even get actually into the industry, we need to address how the institutions themselves, how they sit not only at course level, but at dean level and at director level, and what messages those institutions are actually putting out, because those students coming through will be next generation stepping into the industry. So it needs to happen educationally as well as commercially. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay, my next question is for Francis, and I shall carefully read it out. Oh God, is it a long one? <laughs> no, okay. it leads on from what we've just been discussing really. Concepts of ethics and sustainability have been at the heart of the fashion industry for some time, but do you think these issues have now assumed an even greater importance? Yeah, uh, again, God, there's so many things coming through. I, I just wanted to um, pick up from what Harris said as well. That, that education um, side, it has to infiltrate amongst the brands and the corporates as well, because like Mary was saying, they're perceiving that they're doing right, but some of the, um, the narrative or the, you know, the representation, the presentation, it's tone deaf. And I think a lot of it is is lack of education and, and really un understanding. Um, so, yeah, just following on from that, um, you know, look, with, with LCF um, and not wanting to bang the drum, you know, ethics and sustainability has, has been at the heart of what goes on at curriculum level um, for a really long time. And if I look at the, the sort of businesses that come out or, or the business owners that are coming out of LCF, the, the new business models that are coming out, they're, they're ostensibly um, social enterprises um, uh, with, with ethics and sustainability at their core. So I, I think in a way that the sort of education has, has to start from the get go because you reap what you sow. So I, I think in terms of the new business models that are coming through, um, you know, with our LCF um, alumni are winning awards. Um, uh, we've just had a, a student win the Mayor, Mayor's Challenge with £20,000 investment um, for a sustainable piece of software, which is great. Um, and so I, I think, you know, also the flip side of that is that our students now are wanting jobs where um, they can um, inform in terms of a, an employment um, sort of position where they can inform and, and, and help sort of existing brands with that ethical and sustainable um, steer. So, you know, I can only sort of um, present what I see in terms of um, what's coming um, through. And it, and it does hearten me that this sort of the next generation, hopefully, you know, it, it's like Black Lives Matters or sustainability or ethics, they won't be a thing. It, it'll be just an inherent sense of, of how we sort of all engage and work with each other. So I think for me, it's, it, it is important. It continues to be important, but I think, you know, it's important that we don't, it's just not a, a, a sort of um, hot topic of the day. It's got to resonate for a long, long time, or we're going to sort of still have the conversation about environment and sustainability in another 10 years. We've, we've got to sort of put the marker in the sand now. Thank you. Anyone else? You know, I, I'd just like to, to add to that, having chaired the Ethical Fashion Group and Forum um, now for six years, um, we were making humongous progress um, and every uh, major retailer, manufacturer, designer, brand, had put sustainability right at the top of the agenda. Um, we have to face reality. The mighty have really fallen in the last eight months. 
and they are continually looking at survival um, and quite a, quite a lot of the business of the people that I'm referring to hasn't survived, but it will do in a, on a, on a smaller scale. Um, or those that have survived have, are quite wounded. And it, effectively, whether they have got 20, 30, 40, 50, 100,000 people working for them, um, and they have to find routes to, to continue to, to, to support those employees, um, there's always this question of cost and how and where they can produce to make them viable, which is very sad. It's firstly sad for me because having worked on this for the last six years, we've, um, we've built a, um, a website that engages with 132 countries and we were really going with great guns. Um, we're not relentless, we're relentless, we're gonna continue, but we have to take a we have to take a marginal view that businesses do pay a lot of lip service to sustainability. We're getting used to it and working with it. Now there's an excuse and we can't let that excuse build. There is a sad excuse. It is massive unemployment, a huge amount of job loss, but this word reset has become <laughs> the, the vogue word at this moment in time. Through this reset, we want people or these businesses to reset in a way that is going to be beneficial in terms of, again, climate change. And that's what we're about. And that is what sustainability is about. Um, again, we were only one industry of this, uh, in this climate change um, effort. But we do have to consider employees and I'm talking about the front end employees that are being jobs who are being saved whereas against what we have to do is think about where clothing on mass is being made and not go back to uh, god forbid arena plaza uh, matter again where countries are working people you know to the bone um, just to bring product in to the world uh, at the lowest possible cost. If we as a country in the UK, leaving um, the EU, can regenerate and rebuild our clothing manufacturing industry, that is a very, very big win that would come out of the unfortunate situation we've all found ourselves in over the last eight months. Thank you. Anybody else? Right, Harris, this is partially aimed at you because the last time we actually saw one another physically was at Couture in January this year. Right. So my question is, there appears to be a move away from the historical fashion calendar and the fashion seasonality and the tightness of the, the schedule and calendar. Do you think this is gonna continue um, in a short answer, yes, I believe it definitely will continue because as um, ateliers and brands and designers reconsider what their scheduling will be and where they try and get off of the carousel of trying to meet this insatiable desire which has been forced upon, forced upon them or that they've got on the train and it's always been moving that at a fast pace. Now, a lot of younger brands coming through and even some established brands um, are starting to reconsider how many collections they produce each year. And as that reconsideration continues, that there's, it will become a slowing down in the, in the way and the amounts of shows that will be produced. And as we consider what that means for the fashion show system in itself and then how much money goes into producing these fashion shows and because of the 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 stop that we've had because of the lockdowns and because of covid over this year that reconsideration process in terms of how we show when we show and how often we show it have thrown so many of so many brands and ateliers um, conversations and budgets into question and so as time goes on I think more and more design houses will consider when they show 
how they show and whether that means just one model as a digital catwalk presentation and therefore what those presentations actually mean moving forward for seasons to come. Thank you. Anybody else? Right, moving on to Jason with your next question. Um, it relates really to everything you know we, we've been talking about. The journey a garment makes includes many people and processes. How essential is the integrity and transparency of the employment and treatment of all those involved in that journey? So really the, the transparency of the sourcing and what Harold was talking about a little bit as well. And what we've all talked about is the honesty of the industry. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge, um, a, a huge issue or a huge agenda. It feels like we've been talking about it for, for so long now. I remember, mm -hmm. I think my second year in this industry, which was 21 years ago, um, the child labor discoveries and, mm -hmm. you know, that was a huge agenda. And now it's part of the, um, the ethicality and sustainability, uh, you know, it's seven years ago since Rana Plaza now. It's 1,132 people in that in that building um, who died and two and a half thousand who were injured. I think at what point are we going to say that you have to have supply chain transparency? It's the, as a consumer, I, you know, the, the supermarket delivered the food the other day and. Uh, We'd, we'd ordered the apples for the, this, it's autumn in the UK. We'd ordered the apples from the UK and they came from New Zealand. I was like, oh my mm. gosh, you know, what are we doing to this world where it's cheaper to bring the apples from New Zealand than from the apple tree in Somerset? <laughs> it's crazy. Mm. Um, and I just think that we have to have, we need government to help now. We have to have regulation around supply chain transparency. We have to make it, because uh, Harold's exactly right, we can't have people losing their jobs. But likewise, we can't just use a furlough screen scheme to keep unethical businesses in business. We need to use that money to create ethical businesses faster so that people can work in industries which are positive and beneficial. Um, we have to transfer supply chains and P&Ls to more sustainable, more ethical, more transparent ways of doing businesses. Um, and that's going to mean a new chapter. And it is going to be uh, an exciting thing. I think there's a lot of brilliant groundwork done on it already, but I want to know where my things come from. Yeah. Um, and and I think that it's integral that everybody does. Anybody else like to add? Yeah, may I build on that? Sorry, go ahead. Go. Sorry, Mary, I was just going to say, Jason is right. The power of the public will come into play. And I'm hoping that will put pressure on the brands and the designers and, and everyone in the industry to do the right thing. Um, I was at the, just went to the Copenhagen Fashion Summit and I heard that the, the, the labeling company, Avery Dennison, has come up with something called a reverse label. Have you heard this? Where um, actually there's, a, there's a, a QR code and a customer eventually will be able to scan this QR code on the label in the back of the garment and using blockchain technology will be able to find out where the, the, the raw materials for that garment were sourced, yeah, where the garment was weighed, who made the garment, where it came from, and follow the pattern and the, and the history, if you like, um, the lifeline of that garment. And then the best thing to be able, the QR code will tell you how best and how most sustainably to get rid of that garment. Mm -hmm. So do you take it off to X, you know, place to be recycled or should you break it down yourself or should you try and resell or that sort of thing? So I think this whole transparency piece is going to become absolutely vital mm -hmm. for, for our industry. And, and I want and I know that the public will continue to put pressure on, mm -hmm. on us as retailers and brands to do this. So really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, if, if I can just build Mary, on that, yes. that, was, that was brilliantly said. Um, the point I was going to make was actually that in, in mainstream fashion, we only ever get to see a garment in, in abstract, you know, completely disconnected from the world around us and the journey it's been on. Uh, we don't know how the material you know, came to be, the people who made it, all of that stuff. 
usually that garment arrives at our door just with that sort of surface brand integrity. Now that is changing, but not fast enough, right? But if you compare that with the higher end of the spectrum where you get words like um, artisan starting to appear and, and the further up you go, you know, words like designer, couture. In other words, the more money you spend, the more that you're allowed to find out about the journey of that garment. You know, we're allowed to have that information if we pay for it, which is really weird and messed up. Because actually, if I can just put my, my IBM tech hat on, in these days of transparency and having that data available across every touch point of certainly the retail journey, it's still actually really difficult for an everyday person spending an average amount of money to have that connection with what they're buying. Because when something's abstract, it's, it's actually quite hard to care about what you're buying. So actually until we start, and this is a bit geeky, sorry, until we start plugging that data into those processes along the journey, and then doing something useful with that data so that we as consumers understand more exactly the, the point you were just making. We're never going to really be able to crack some of those, those bigger issues and, you know, what, what integrity means. The other big part, as you were just saying, Sim, is that the notion of the journey itself, you know, it shouldn't stop at the point of purchase. It needs to keep going through the journey of that garment who's wearing it, you know, second, third hand, repair, restoration. That's all part of the journey too. So until we reassess that, and we have the tools to do that now, and the data, as you were just saying, it's not going to change. So how do we get there quicker? Also, as Jason was saying as well, how do we accelerate at this time? Uh, I think, Paris. No, I think we can only accelerate when the industry and the business, businesses as a whole actually w start wanting to implement these kinds of changes. But as it stands, we work, fashion has been based on a capitalist model, stack it high, sell it cheap at whatever level of the industry, even if it's glossed up with like bows and kind of velour or whatever it would be. So I think it's how does an industry which is based on profit margins start to have a conscience where it actually starts to care about the consumers. And I think that's a very different model to the way in which most people engage with fashion. Your average consumer, even though they have some form of power, aren't aware of that power because we as those who dictate what happens, what appears on the runway and then happens, appears in the stores, are all running on this metric where it's about making it look as glossy as possible to be able to sell as much as possible, which is why so many of us are kept in the jobs that we have. So until the whole industry as a whole changes the way that the business looks at transparency and also starts to have a conscience to therefore be able to prevent further run of plazas happening, we're still gonna be having these conversations for a long time to come. Jason. And the final thing is we've got to, we've got to get rid of greenwashing in advertising. You know, we're not allowed to rightly so add, you know, advertise that a product's going to do something for you if it won't do it. You can't advertise cigarettes, rightly so. You know, the commission step in and stop fake advertising. So why it's okay to advertise something like a recycled plastic trainer when possibly the plastic is an ocean plastic. It's actually made to be recycled. Or I saw an advert the other day. It said 50% of the lining of this shoe is made from recycled materials. And the lining of the shoe is about 30% of the product anyway, which is an advert that's actually saying 70% of this product is not made from recycled materials. <laughs> and I just think we need to kind of outlaw this horrible greenwashing that we've got going on at the moment. Yeah. It's Tony, Thank you. Tony just, yeah. just one quick um, question. You know, we're looking at blockchain. Um, I, I think also we're, we're sort of thinking that the, the bigger companies have the answers and if I look at some of our alumni that have come through over the last sort of um, three four years that have, have built blockchain into their business models um, know your label um, a, a student called Charlotte Howden just sort of um, been named in Forbes 30 under 30 last year what you've just been talking to that's her business model um, you know in, in in a nutshell and the interesting thing is it's grown exponentially year on year because actually people are looking at it and thinking actually 
I'd rather buy my my white T-shirt from you because I know where it comes from. And, and I think that storytelling uh, in, in terms of the marketing, the comms is, is coming through and, and going to be more prevalent as well. So that's just a shout out for one of our alumni businesses, sorry. <laughs> well, it leads very neatly into my question for Mary. So Mary, this was written before all this conversation, but it said, I said, it seems as if the story behind a designer's collection or a brand's range needs to have a purpose, transparency and integrity but in your opinion, is this just a selling ploy? Okay, I'm glad you gave me a, a not controversial question. <laughs> um, <laughs> my, my first response to that is actually, there's nothing wrong with a selling ploy. Um, I quite like it when brands and shops and people make a bit of an effort to sell something to me. I guess the point is, what is that selling strategy based on? You know, where did that story come from who's telling the story who's the audience etc um and, and that's actually where some of the issues around uh, you know sustainability gender race other markers of, of diversity and inclusivity that we've, we've mentioned that, that they actually come into play and actually you can boil it down to uh, kind of who's allowed into the club and who's deciding the rules behind that and that's where integrity comes into it uh, with those stories and actually here's here's a shout out for London College of Fashion um, one of the things I, I really enjoyed and that stuck in my mind about the recent um, the, the, the online graduate show it was when I was looking through the BA in fashion journalism um, presentation and it was a, a magazine called uh, Clubber by a student called Paul Toner um, the reason this is stuck in my memory is that I've never seen fashion stories featuring the kind of people I grew up with in, in Liverpool or Dublin or Edinburgh, or that I see every day like where, where I live near Burnley in Lancashire. Well, I mean, I'd seen them in that kind of cultural tourism way that you see in kind of Sunday glossy supplements, but not, you know, not in, in real world. And I, I read the copy that Paul had written to go with the stories and, and, the, and the, uh, the clothes that he was showing. And I'll tell you, it actually just made me laugh my wig off because mm -hmm. it had real humor, real character. I could tell immediately like where that story had, had come from. Um, and it wasn't concocted by, you know, someone who went to public yeah. school and, and doesn't know where Leeds is, you know. Um, but, but the way he wrote about those clothes and put that story together and what they meant to, to him and his, and his mates and his tribe, that story came across with more integrity and transparency than, than any multi-million pound marketing campaign I've ever seen. You know, it clearly wasn't an agency with a hundred people with um, uh, strange trousers and fashionable haircuts that wrote it. I used to know, I used to work in those, right? And I, I know I'm like a stuck record, but the transparency in itself isn't the story. It's more around who made this, how was it made and, and all of that stuff. And I want to see the craft and, and the people behind that in, in every aspect, in you know the physical finished thing, but also the process behind that. Because isn't that what's really interesting and, and what connects us as, as human beings mm -hmm. as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else thinks? Thank you very much. Who's next to chime in? Anybody else want to add? Right, I'm going on to Harold. Um, many designers and brands have already reduced or cut the number of collections and the size of those collections they offer each year. Do you think this is going to continue? I think uh, needs must. And I think that uh, as with anything uh, that, that we've all had to adapt to um, during this year, uh, the economies of scale have necessitated um, uh, speed to market and cost savings as best possible. And development of collections is one of the most costliest parts 
um, of a designer's business. Um, one would hope now that we all um, have reached a point of utopia as a vaccine. And one would hope again that third quarter next year returns lives in fashion and the rest of, of, of our um, a life uh, to, to normality. Um, and I feel that there will be the need for the excitement that goes and drive that goes behind a fashion show. There's going to be a stronger element towards online showing uh, presentations, but there will still be what is, is the season that gets everybody. If you're in a business that is design led, the need to actually produce that collection for that time of the year. So if we base ourselves on the principle, there are two main seasons. Um, and that's where you work to what you work towards. There's been something that's been created probably over the last 10, 15 years that are interim collections as well. That, that's driven businesses to grow. It's driven designers to have the thought process of re-emerging and re-engaging with their customers or if they're in direct retail with their consumer. And I would like to feel that there's going to be the um, continuity or, or go back to how it was. This is just what I would hope that there is this ongoing um, dream to keep creating something different and something new. It's what this industry has always thrived on, and that's what fashion is uh, at all levels. Um, so I, I could only take a view as a business person. What has happened is the slowdown. Now we need to hope that there's going to be uh, the pickup and um, we will get back to the, the, as I said in one of my earlier, my earlier, I said, there is as much clothing being worn, there's as much clothing being sold, it's being sold differently, but newness and creativity is always what fashion is going to require. That's just my opinion. Right. Well, I've got one final question, which you'll all have an answer to, and I'm going to start with Sim. What is the one key word you would offer as advice to a newly established fashion enterprise or brand going forward right now. What advice in maybe one or two words would you say? One word. You can Agile. have two. Agile. 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 Yeah. You said one. One. Mm -hmm. Mary. Courage. Thank you. Francis. Values. Harris. Conviction. Jason. Differentiate. And last but not least again, Harold, what's your one word of advice? Can I have two? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Stay focused. Thank you very much indeed. We have finished wonderfully early, everybody. So I would just finally throw it open if there's anything that anybody else wants to say about anything to do with fashion change, the way things are going, any hopes, or if there's anything anyone felt they wanted to add to any of the questions earlier on. We have 10 minutes or so. Are we all happy? You didn't oh, I, the optimism question. Yeah, I think that we need to um, think a lot. You know, we've watched a lot of tearing down over the last kind of couple of years, and I think we really need to focus on building up again. Mm -hmm. the fashion hasn't been torn apart. The business models have, have, have changed, and the supply chains have changed, and the consumer desire has adapted. But I think let's get through this lockdown 
have a really good holiday in Christmas period and then start building a really awesome, creative, agile, fun industry, which people just desperately want to be a part of. That's why I guess all of us are in it, right? We just really wanted to be a part mm. of a movement. And I really want to get back to that moment in the industry. Thank you. Anybody else? We've been working at London College of Fashion for the last nearly 30 weeks. Every week we've done a report and it's about what's been happening in fashion, not what could happen or might happen and not directly in response to the global pandemic or to politics. But what we've noticed is that every week fashion continues to function. Every week fashion continues to do something creative and that the response is always to move forward and to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. And I think hopefully all that you've said and all your comments and observations and responses adds to that optimism, that energy and that creativity that obviously London College of Fashion is all about, but I believe still that the fashion industry is about. So all I have to do is to thank everybody very much indeed for giving up your time. I hope it's all been worthwhile and that you found it interesting. And I bid you all good afternoon and take care. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Tony. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thanks guys.